Namaste. Well, in the last video, we covered how the heart is the seat of Brahman. And that actually the different states of consciousness are all simply emanations from the heart. And now in this sutra, Sutra 9, Ramana is going to affirm this and give even more details about the heart. Devotee, how can it be said that the heart is no other than Brahman? Maharshi, the self enjoys its experiences in the states of waking, dream, and deep sleep, residing respectively in the eyes, throat, and heart. In reality, however, it never leaves its principal seat, the heart. In the heart lotus, which is of the nature of all, in other words, in the mind space, the light of that self shines in the form of I. As it shines thus in everybody, this very self is referred to as the witness, Sakshi, and the transcendent, Turiya, literally the fourth. It's the fourth because it's the fourth state of consciousness after waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. And it's actually the root of the other three. So because Turiya is the root, it is always active. We are in Turiya consciousness, or Turiya consciousness is active all the time. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be able to experience the other states. So even though in waking, consciousness seems to be centered in the eyes, and in dreaming in the throat, in deep sleep, it's in the heart. But in deep sleep, consciousness is covered by ignorance. Turiya, however, is never covered by ignorance. And thus, the feeling of I is there even in deep sleep. But there's another stage that's even beyond this. The eyeless Supreme Brahman, which shines in all bodies as interior to the light in the form of I, is the self space or awareness space. That alone is the absolute reality. This is the super transcendent, Turiyatita. Therefore, it is stated that what is called the heart is none other than Brahman. Moreover, for the reason that Brahman shines in the hearts of all souls as the self, the name heart is given to Brahman. The meaning of the word hridayam, when split as hridayam, is in fact Brahman. The adequate evidence for the fact that Brahman, which shines as the self, resides in the hearts of all, is that all people indicate themselves by pointing to the chest when saying I. Now there's a lot here. I'm going to have to unpack this carefully. <laughs> Part of our consciousness has the I feeling. And that is the four states, waking, dreaming, sleeping, and Turiya. The feeling of I-ness is there because it's present in Turiya. And all these four states of consciousness have objects. In other words, in waking consciousness, it's the senses and the outside world. In dreaming consciousness, it's the mind. In deep sleep, it's simply the sensation of being. In Turiya, its objects are the other three states of consciousness. In other words, Turiya is consciousness of consciousness. 
And finally, Turiyatita, meaning beyond Turiya, is simply awareness. It's just the feeling of being. It doesn't have an object, or you could say its object is its own self. But there is no outside object. So this objective, objectless, unconditioned, transcendental awareness is Brahman. I, I. I am aware that I am aware. So this is Turiya Tita, beyond even Turiya, beyond the fourth state, beyond all objects, beyond even the feeling of I. He calls Brahman the I-less Supreme Brahman. How is that? Because the feeling of I is distinguished in distinction from not I or the other. Because the four states of consciousness have objects, they divide into I and not I, into the subject and the object, into the seer and the seen. This is duality. But Turiyatita is not like that. It has no object. So Brahman is also like that. It has no boundaries. It has no divisions into self and other or subject and object. It has no duality. Therefore, it is non-dual. Advaita. Now, there are many people claiming to know Advaita. And a lot of them may know something, but very few of them are actually realized. Why? Because they have not gone through the preliminaries of distinguishing the four states of consciousness. They cannot, for example, go into lucid dreaming, or what to speak of the state of uh, deep sleep and maintain consciousness. But one who is a master of consciousness, who really knows consciousness, can go into the heart cave and be as Brahman without any sense of I. In this case, there is no ego because there is no division. There is no duality. There is no difference, no action, no motion, no dimension, no time, no change, no transformation. But the people who talk about being Brahman or being in non-dual consciousness are always talking about transformation and, you know, all this kind of stuff. We don't buy it. They're simply imitation. And the thing that proves that their imitation is their lack of compassion. Because one who actually realizes this heart space is going to have infinite compassion for all living beings. They are going to dedicate their life to spreading this truth, not simply collecting donations, but actually training people and helping people to realize this truth of non-dual consciousness, Brahman. And Brahman is in the heart. So you find they are very heartful people, very loving, full of compassion, calm, passion. Oh, I wanted to talk about that word, hridaya. Hridaya means heart in Sanskrit. But if we split it into its roots, it's hrit, which means devoid of, or lacking, or taken away. And I am, which means I am. So that which takes away the feeling of I am 
is Brahman, because Brahman is egoless, being non-dual. It is not divided. So that's all we can really know about Brahman. And it's only knowing about it. It's not knowing it directly. So we can say there's this space. <laughs> we can point at it where there's no duality, no differences, no boundaries, unlimited, timeless, actionless and karmaless and so on. But we can't really know Brahman through words and explanations. We can only know it by entering the heart cave in meditation. And this takes some work. The spontaneous enlightenment that many claim to have is at best first path. First path is an authentic experience of Brahman. But it's Brahman as something outside oneself, as an object, not as a subject. So one can have first path and still be in ego consciousness. And we see a lot of people are. It happens often. Or when, I mean, as often as people get first path, which isn't very often. <laughs> But when most people get first path, they think that's it. I got it. I'm enlightened. Now off to conquer the world. <laughs> it happened to so many. It happened to me when I got first path. Luckily, I failed. And I realized, oops, I have to go back to the Zendo, <laughs> back to the ashram and meditate some more. And then I was very fortunate to re meet an actual realized teacher, Nyanananda, and he got me straightened out. <laughs> and very shortly thereafter, I got the rest of the path realizations. So if one has an authentic teacher, then one can attain the highest. It is not that you simply go off in the woods by yourself without any direction or inspiration and realize this. It's not so easy. It's not so cheap. One really has to dedicate one's life. Between the experience of first path and second path took me 33 years mainly because I did not have enough background in non-dual philosophy to understand what I was going through. And I don't mean just throwing around a bunch of catchphrases or imitating what is said by some authentically self-realized people. But I mean the actual under-the-hood knowledge of how it all works. That takes a long time to acquire mainly because we have to decondition ourselves from the dualistic understanding, from linear time and cause and effect. But once we do that, then the other path realizations subsequent to the first path can come relatively quickly within just a few years. So even though Enlightenment happens in an instant. The preparation for enlightenment takes a long time. And it should, because we have been in conditioned consciousness for many lifetimes. Until we can penetrate to the heart, hridaya, and know that non-dual self, we cannot falsely claim to be enlightened. It's just a scam, and it's just going to wind up exploiting others, which is going to create karma that will keep us bound for another long period of time. So be very cautious. Do your homework. Make sure you know the fundamentals and the basics very, very well. 
then meditation will be fruitful and it will certainly lead step by step to the pinnacle of self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.